In 2012, Camperini's memoir, Caveat Emptor, was published by Pegasus Press. This landmark book that caused a storm of controversy in the art world in New York and London chronicles his career as a master painter and art forger that spanned over 30 years. Camperini is still producing what he describes as the most deceptive fakes in the world. This is the first in a series of shows. Ken will begin by addressing the most frequently asked questions since the publication of Caveat Emptor. In future shows, Ken will give demonstrations of how he creates his masterful paintings and share many secret techniques he developed over the years as an art forger. Ken will also share his views on many topics, including the history of European and American painting, and give surprising insights on his favorite painters. Now, here is Ken Perini. A fake is a complicated construction. It's a blend of art, science, and psychology all in one object. And um, for me, uh, faking paintings was always a contest of wits. For me it was like a sport. Uh, I enjoyed it. It was a challenge. Uh, I want to... Uh, I I'm going to show you how to, to, to make a fake right from the beginning. And we have to uh, start at the, the, the most basic level. And first I want to set the stage a little. Uh, when I was uh, first exposed to the art world, it was in the late 60s. I wrote about that in my book. And uh, I uh, began getting fascinated with the, the art world and the culture of the art world. Uh, I started walking around Madison Avenue, going to galleries, museums, and, um, and art shows, and auction houses. And I was immersing myself in, in, in the art world and the culture. I started uh, observing the way people dressed, the way they acted in, the, in, in this world. Uh, and it was very different uptown on the Upper East Side as opposed to, say, downtown which was like contemporary artists, uh, the young uh, artists that were doing things in the uh, avant-garde world. These were two different worlds. I liked the Upper East Side. Now, for those of you that may not be familiar with uh, New York City, the Upper East Side is where the rich, the very rich, and the uber-rich live. Uh, you have three main avenues. You have uh, Fifth Avenue, Madison Avenue, and Park Avenue. And um, from the from the from say 57th Street up to 90th Street is prime area. This is uh, a, a very very wealthy, and this is where on Madison Avenue, which is the commercial avenue going up uh, on the Upper East Side, is where you have your uh, your cafes, your restaurants, the expensive boutiques, jewelry stores, and you have your art galleries. And uh, when I, was, uh, when I was young, and maybe around 18 years old, 19 years old, uh, I was seeing um, the last of a world that I believe has disappeared on the Upper East Side, and that was a lot of small galleries that were run by Europeans. A lot of these Europeans had fled uh, Europe from World War I, brought a wave of them over, including Mr. Jory, the frame dealer that I knew. Uh, and then World War II brought a lot of these dealers over. The reason they left Europe was because Europe was, uh, was in shambles, it was uh, war-torn, it was dangerous, and those that could got out of Europe, maybe their families had been in the business for generations, and they set up shop in the New World, New York City. And prime area was Upper East Side. Those that couldn't afford it went down into the village. There were a lot of old antique shops and art dealers in the village that came from New York too, but they were never, they didn't have the money to get up on the Upper East Side. Madison Avenue, a small shop in those days, like say around 69, 68, 69, a small shop there 
would rent for uh, about $600-$650. Um, but that was a lot of money then. And they were, it, it was very easy to just walk into galleries and get into conversations with people. And that's what I started doing. Uh, the more I got interested in art, the more I would go to the Metropolitan, uh, look at great paintings there. Metropolitan was empty. I could spend all day there just staring at paintings all I wanted. Then I could walk over to Madison Avenue and I could um, go into galleries and shops and um, at least have a conversation with these people. What was unusual was that someone so young would walk into a gallery to look at paintings. Usually it was middle-aged people that they, it was the usual type of customer. So when someone young came in, sometimes they would chat you up, some of them were very friendly, and the next thing you know, they're talking about their life in Europe, where they came from, how they set up shop in New York, and they're pulling out paintings to show me examples of what they dealt in, stories of how they found paintings in Europe. So I was constantly accumulating knowledge from people about, about the history of art dealing. Now, on the Upper East Side, you had a number of second-tier auction houses. You had Coleman on uh, 72nd Street and York Avenue. You had the Savoy Galleries on 55th Street, just off 5th Avenue. Uh, downtown, you had Astor and Tepper. And these were galleries, auction houses, that uh, I would liken them to what you would find in, on Locks Road today in London. They were second-tier. The paintings, there were lots of paintings, lots of great frames, but second-rate old masters, second- and third-rate old masters. But you could go in there and just pick them up, handle them. They were period. I could look at the stretchers. I could look at the canvas. Some of them had holes punched through them. So some of them weren't worth anything more than the frame that they were being sold for. But it was great to be exposed to that. That doesn't exist any, anymore in New York City, but you will still find that in London. What I'm describing can still be done today somewhere in the world. And I would say London would be my favorite city, really, uh, would be a place where you could do very much what I'm describing now. Um, as I started uh, spending more time in, in the, in the uh, Upper East Side and visiting galleries and making friends with some of the gallery owners, in, in a sense, when I say friends, I mean, uh, I, I, they, would in, they would get to know me, and they, uh, whenever I was in the neighborhood, I would stop in, and I could sit down and talk with them. Uh, I, I began to dress differently. And I was the 60s, and uh, of course I had all the, uh, uh, the uh, clothes of the period, you know, the, 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 the jeans and the t-shirts and all that stuff that the hippies wore. But then my life began to bifurcate. I had that side of me, uh, my friends in Jersey and, and um, you know, the, the hippie culture of, of that time. But I started going to places like Bloomingdale's and Saks and buying conservative clothes, uh, well-made, expensive clothes, so that I could fit in in the Upper East Side uh, art scene. And this was very important. You know, clothing has always been a, uh, uh, a big compon component of, uh, of my life because it's an expression of who you are. It's a language. And when you walk into auction houses and galleries, they look at you carefully and you're, you're broadcasting what your background is, what your uh, interests are, and what, your, what kind of world you come from by the clothes you wear. So I caught on to that very early on, and I um, developed a taste for uh, <laughs> very expensive clothes. <laughs> Started going to Brooks Brothers and, and uh, Paul Stewart and places like that in time. But anyway, I, would, uh, I had a friend that said, told me once, you know, if you just get out there and start doing things, start circulating, things happen. And that was very true. Uh, I remember a gallery I went to, it uh, dealt in post-impressionist paintings. Uh, uh, and um, I passed it and I, well, I noticed a, a very pretty girl sitting at the, uh, at the desk. She was a receptionist. 
It was a very small gallery in the 60s there in Madison Amos. I, I thought I'd walk in one day. And sure enough, uh, we, we, uh, she started chatting me up and we were talking. And, and I still remember her name. And, uh, it was Rouland. And she was from Paris, living in New York. And she was a, she was a painter too. And I told her I was an artist. And, uh, and uh, well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the next thing I know, uh, I was um, meeting her for lunch. and. Um, Looking at her artworks, and she had a she had a show on on Lexington Avenue. Uh, she was about twenty six, you know. I was only around eighteen uh, <laughs> at that time, and uh, she had a show. I, I even went I went to, um, to her show with Tony, uh, my friend, and Tony didn't like it because everybody was speaking French there. So he he didn't like that too much. He didn't appreciate it, but. Uh, Roland was a great gal, and she was a friend that I made for years. So I started making friends right in the neighborhood. I mean, one time she called me up and she said, hey, I'm going to a, a brunch at the, uh, the St. Regis Hotel in Salvador Dali's hosting it. Do you want to come? Well, of course I went. So things would happen, and I would meet Salvador Dali and many other people there. Uh, people I even met at Max's Kansas City was sitting there. So if you get out there and you get a, a break somehow, you start meeting people, things just happen. And they happen easy in the art world because if you're the kind of type, type of person that they, uh, that they like or you, you fit the, 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 uh, uh, the, the profile of the, uh, of the artsy type intellectual, pseudo-intellectual, you uh, can very easily get invitations and meet all kinds of people because they, they need people in these galleries. It's very cool to look at the kind of trash. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this was my, um, the way I spent a lot of my first years in the art world, just circulating around, absorbing knowledge like a sponge from everybody I could meet, going to every show I could, going to auction houses, handling paintings, spending hours in museums, and staring at paintings. I'm not going to go into how I started faking paintings, that's all in my book, but uh, for me, I had to, um, it was a challenge. It was, a, it was a, an intriguing um, problem for me. How do you make something modern and, and have, make an expert, hope an expert, who's going to examine it, believe that it's, uh, it's period, that it's 100, 200, or 300 years old. That's, that's quite a challenge. And as I said, it's a complicated problem to solve. When I, there were two methods that I developed in my career. Uh, I would say the most tried and true method that forgers, of old masters that is, used was to start with a period work of art, a period painting. Uh, and that's called the support. Now, here's a couple of examples. These are actual paintings from the 19th century. I bought the pair of these in an antique shop somewhere. But they're period. These are American. And um, you would start with something like this. Then you would, what I would do is remove the painting that's on here, which is, of course, worthless. Maybe I paid 50 bucks for the pair of these. I don't know. But the important thing is the back. The back is what an expert is going to look, look, uh, look at and examine carefully. So you have to have a period work of art to start with. Now, I, I have methods that I'll get into more detail in other shows of removing this, this painting that's on here. It's very thinly painted. There's very little paint on here. If I found this in a flea market somewhere and there was a lot of impasto on there, it would not be usable. But these were um, acceptable to me because the paint that's on here is very thinly painted. And if I hold this to an angle, I could see the pattern of the canvas underneath. 
So I would remove this um, painting. I describe a method that I use in my book. And then I would apply another coat of gesso on it. And I would wind up with this. So here we have a period painting, 19th century, square jointed, even old labels on the back here of manufacturers from the 19th century, traces of labels around here. It's all oxidized. Now, now in the 19th century, when this was new and sold in an art supply store, maybe in New York, Boston, or Philadelphia, it was brand new. It was clean. The wood was clear. Uh, but through the years, it has oxidized into this caramel, brown, black combination of colors. Because everything in the world oxidizes, except gold. Uh, everything is exposed to oxygen, and it rusts in a way. And so does wood and canvas. So here we have now a nice period canvas. It's oxidized. I stripped the painting from it, and I sprayed on a very, very thin coat of gesso. In fact, this gesso coating on here is so thin that if you held this to an angle, you would still see the patternation of the canvas. So this was a first step, and that was to um, start with a correct support. Before I got into this method, I used to do it with wooden panels, but that's an entirely different subject, and I'm going to deal with that separately. Uh, for now, I want to show the most uh, 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 commonly used methods that forgers have used. Um, now, after we got this far, and we had this, then we could um, simply paint a picture on it, like this, uh, <laughs> this uh, Martin Johnson Heed, and, uh, and you see the back of it right here. See, it's all sunken in, it has some patches here, and it's a very thin stretcher too, very dainty, very, very nicely made in the period. But when this was painted on here, uh, and then I put a patina over this and uh, dusted it down and, and uh, abraded it a little around the edges. This is a very convincing fake. This is what I call a real high-class fake. Let me show you another example. Here's a, um, a, uh, a Martin Johnson Heat, a Magnolia painting, you see? And again, the same thing on the back. So these are examples of fakes that were produced on period canvases or supports. So that's, that's one method. But as time went on and uh, <laughs> I became so prolific, I didn't have, I, I didn't have time to waste running around to antique shops and flea markets to find truckloads of these these paintings that I could reconstitute into, in, into fake. So I had to find a more practical solution to this problem because I was flooding the, the, the art markets with fakes and uh, you know the demand was so high that I had to, uh, I had to uh, invest some research and development into a, a, a new method. <laughs> 